Hello, and welcome to the Inflammatory Bowel Disease series of webinars produced in conjunction with the Royal College of General Practitioners and Crohn's and Colitis UK. This is the first of the series, and today we're going to talk about diagnosing inflammatory bowel disease. I'm Kevin Barrett, a GP and lead clinical champion for the Spotlight Project. These webinars will be produced with some of the other clinical champions, um, including Keris, who are here later on. So inflammatory bowel disease is one of the conditions that we've all heard about at medical school. Um, it can be very easy to diagnose in patients who present with very typical symptoms. However, sometimes it gets confusing and patients often report it can take a long time to, to reach a diagnosis. And the recent uh, patient survey that was produced by um, IBD UK said that around about one in 25 patients still wait over a year to be diagnosed. So typical symptoms include that triad of abdominal pain, diarrhea, weight loss, and things like rectal bleeding and anemia. And those symptoms, it's very easy for us to think there's, there's some physical pathology going on as well. However, not all patients present like that. Quite a few patients present with constipation, with mouth ulcers, because IBD can affect anywhere from the mouth down to the anus, particularly with Crohn's disease. Um, children, failure to thrive can be a big issue as well. We know that 44% of children actually with IBD don't present with any change in bowel habit, which can make it particularly hard for us to diagnose. Anorexia is quite common, um, and sometimes, ch sometimes children, particularly teenagers, people in their early 20s, are mislabeled as having anorexia when in fact they have um, inflammatory bowel disease, partly because the inflammatory process itself can affect your appetite, and partly because eating food, particularly trigger foods, can set off symptoms, so patients can deliberately, subconsciously or consciously avoid certain foods. So there is a lot of overlap there between, between those two, two conditions. Um, and malnutrition is really important as well. So we see patients present with nutritional deficiencies, with um, anemia, as I mentioned before, vitamin D deficiencies, a whole range of different things that, that can be because the bowel doesn't work. One key symptom that's always worth asking, and this is something I've learned to ask of patients that, that come to us with a change in bowel habit, is actually, do you get up at night to have a poo? Because conditions like um, irritable bowel syndrome, on the whole, patients sleep through the night quite happily without having to wake up to go to the toilet because they, they might go to it several times during the day, they might have urgency, a whole range of symptoms that sound very similar to inflammatory bowel disease, um, but they sleep quite solidly for six, seven, eight hours, and then wake up and they might have to go to the toilet once they've had something to eat. Whereas inflammatory bowel disease, one of those key symptoms that can occur is actually being woken up in the middle of the night by abdominal pain, by urgency, and by actually having to get out of bed and go to the toilet. Um, and that's a, a question that's always worth asking. And, and for me, that sets off alarm bells whenever I hear a patient telling me they have to wake up in the middle of the night to go to the toilet. So inflammatory bowel disease, that name is a little bit misleading as well because it's a, it's a whole system um, infl inflammation that can occur. Um, so it's not just the bowel that can be affected too. Extra intestinal symptoms can be quite common, um, particularly affecting the eyes. So any inflammatory condition of the eyes uh, can occur with inflammatory bowel disease. The liver conditions such as primary sclerosing cholangitis can occur, which is one of those conditions that is quite rare, um, but can be very, very serious and, and lead to liver transplants um, and a range of other conditions too. Um, joint problems are very common in inflammatory bowel disease. So around about 14% have an inflammatory arthritis, although lots of patients with IBD complain about joint pains. Um, so again, it's worth thinking about that. Um, there's an overlap in the symptoms you get with uh, other inflammatory conditions, so rheumatoid arthritis, again, sometimes they get bowel problems too. So again, there may be an underlying cause, which we'll come on to a little bit later on. And skin problems are, are quite common. The picture on here is um, of a patient who put this picture on Twitter and said, these are my legs, these are these painful, horrible, sore um, nodules. So things like erythaminidosum and pyoderma gangrenosum um, are on there. And patients present with that. Actually, the key, the key thing to um, help them is to get the IBD under control as well. So topical treatments don't tend to work particularly well um, without actually thinking about the systemic effects. So differential diagnosis, I think it's always useful to think about this. So when a patient comes to us, with a persistent history of a change in bowel habit and a range of lower abdominal symptoms, I always get my surgical sieve out because that's how I was taught at medical school uh, because the symptoms can overlap with all sorts of different things. So IBS is really common, um, affecting between 10 and 20% of the population at any one time. Gastroenteritis can mimic IBD. Uh, this tends to be a very different history. There's often a very clear start point, a very short-lived history with it as well. Um, and often you see clusters of people affected by it too. So it's always important just to bear that in mind as well. 
see that disease can be underdiagnosed. We know that it affects around about 1% of the population um, and the abdominal pain and the mal malnutrition absorption that can affect uh, that can occur with that can also mimic inflammatory bowel disease. Colorectal carcinoma. Now we know from NICE MG12 that that's one of those conditions that, that we're taught not to miss. The NICE guidance is quite complicated with different age cutoff points for different bowel symptoms and different weight loss and things as well. Um, and patients with IBD can certainly fit into that, those categories as well. So it's always important not to not to miss that. Ovarian carcinoma. Now again, NICE MG12 says that any patient with new onset IBS type symptoms in a female patient who is postmenopausal, so 50 or above, you should always think about ovarian carcinoma uh, and do a primary care diagnostic test such as a CA125 um, or uh, an ultrasound scan um, to rule that out as well. So always think about those things in the back of your mind again. And again, endometriosis. Uh, we know that, that uh, the bowel symptoms of that can be quite severe in some patients with produce abdominal pain, rectal bleeding, um, weight loss, a whole range of different things as well. So all those things kind of can blur the boundaries as well. And the final one to think about, particularly in populations, so those you know, men who have sex with men in particular, um, any form of proctitis uh, can mimic IBD with diarrhea, weight loss, abdominal pain, bloody diarrhea, mucus, a whole range of things as well. So all of those conditions can mimic inflammatory bowel disease. So it can be quite hard for us as GPs to actually pick the needle out of the haystack and think which patients do we need to do which tests for. And we hear stories, as we talked about before, about patients who are mislabeled with other conditions. Um, some patients use the word misdiagnosed, and that's a term I, I'm not particularly keen on um, because, you know, as, as GPs, we can't we can't diagnose IBD. That requires uh, colonoscopies and biopsies as well. But we can mislabel or or put uh, different codes in our records that that might put might point patients towards different diagnoses. And we all know that once a patient has a, has a, has a diagnosis or has a label on their record, it's very easy for, for us or for colleagues seeing those patients to assume that any new symptoms are part of that, uh, part of that series as well. So just bear in mind, actually, if, a, if the patient's symptoms are different to normal, or they don't quite ring, the, you know, they're quite, quite ring true, or there's little alarm bells going off in the back of your mind, just go back, reassess them and think, actually, is this a condition that we, we, th we think they have? Quite a lot of patients say that they were misdiagnosed with IBS for a long time. Um, and certainly the, the prevalence or the likelihood of getting inflammatory bowel disease is slightly raised in patients that have IBS. However, is that because actually they did have IBD in the first place? Or is it something to do with, the, with IBS that does predispose you to that? Nobody knows the answer for that for sure. Um, so but just bear that in mind that IBS isn't always IBS and you can also develop other conditions on top of IBS as well. And again, as before, we talked that IBS is much, much more common than IBD. That prevalence of 0.4% for IBD is probably actually incorrect. Um, that's an old figure that was used from a couple of years ago. There's an increasing evidence actually that the prevalence of IBD uh, is much greater than this. There's a paper published in the BMJ at the end of 2019 that said the prevalence is actually closer to 1%, uh, particularly in southern Scotland. Uh, and there's some unpublished data from Wales uh, that, that correlates with that as well. So potentially 1% of the population have IBD. Uh, which is actually much more than, than previously thought as well. So you know, a typical practice may have more patients than, than, than we thought beforehand. So when we started the Spotlight project, we did a survey uh, and we asked lots of people um, what they thought about IBD and how confident they were in diagnosing it as well. And we had 624 responses and we had 525 responses from GPs or GP trainees. And we asked them, how confident are you in identifying IBD? Uh, so I don't know what you think about this, whether whether you thought 89% were confident or, or very confident, 73%, 54% or 27%. Um, so have a little think and just see what you think, what the answer is yourself. How confident are you when, when it comes to diagnosing IBD? But it turns out that GPs, we all think we're brilliant at, at diagnosing things, and 89% of GPs felt they were confident or very confident, which I think is probably true. If a patient comes to us with, with very, very classic, very typical symptoms, um, then I think that's that's probably about right. However, those patients who have less typical symptoms, they're the ones that, that can fall between the gaps sometimes um, and then end up with long journeys to getting diagnosed. So IBD diagnostic pathways, it's not just about primary care. 
is making sure that actually that we refer patients appropriately and when patients are referred they get seen quickly and IBD UK are doing lots and lots of work with that. Um, we know that in some parts of the country it can take a long time to get to see a gastroenterologist. Um, this is an example of a project that they did in, in Stockport with one of the IBD champions, Rachel, and she set up uh, a, a, a new pathway where um, effectively any referrals that came in for lower abdominal symptoms were triaged by her and she contacted them um, make sure the all right tests were done and then book them into clinics much more quickly. And this did reduce dramatically the waiting time for patients to be diagnosed. So if hopefully your area has got a referral pathway for this, um, if it hasn't, have a chat to your commissioners and colleagues and say, can we do something like this? Um, I think the only cost with this was, was the price of a mobile phone. Um, there's no other organisational cost, no IT, nothing else involved. It's just about reorganising what they did. <laughs> So for those of us who like pathways, um, I'm going to talk about NICE DG11, um, which is a pathway that's based upon the York and Humberside Academic Health Science Network pathway for diagnosing IBD. And this again talks to us about patients that come to us with symptoms that might be IBD, might be IBS, uh, might be colorectal cancer as well, um, and talks us through things. So when it comes to these pathways, I always tend to kind of rush straight down to the bottom and forget about the red flags. So again, don't forget about NICE ND12 criteria. If a patient has those symptoms, they get sent off through a two week wait pathway if you're in England um, or other pathways uh, in other parts of the UK. Red flags are really key on here as well. And again, nocturnal symptoms, the red flag that's up there along with family history, rectal bleeding. Um, again, there's no point doing uh, a fit test um, when a patient with rectal bleeding because it's going to be positive. Um, any patient with unexplained rectal bleeding needs to be investigated. So those patients generally, if they've got very obvious hemorrhage that are bleeding, that's fine. Um, if they haven't and they still persist with rectal bleeding, they need to be sent off for some form of investigation as well because we can miss conditions like that. However, if a patient doesn't have that, um, then we do our, our basic blood test. We talked about full celiac screen, inflammatory markers, full blood count, still culture if they've got a very short history on there as well and again some basic things including thyroid function tests because again hyperthyroidism can be can be uh, can present with with a change in bowel habit sometimes and if those tests come back positive then you treat them appropriately if, if they're anemic with raised inflammatory markers then obviously there's something going on they need to be referred on um, to secondary care if you do those tests uh, and then they're all negative then the calprotectin is the next test that's worth doing um, so faecal calprotectin, um, it's a calcium binding protein secreted by neutrophils in response to inflammation. You can test it in any fluid, um, but here we're testing it in, in feces. Um, it's quite a good test. Again, it's a screening test, not a diagnostic test. Uh, you can get false negatives in children because they have uh, slightly different levels of calprotectin to adults as well. Microscopic colitis, which lots of people, including Crohn's and Colitis UK, do label as an inflammatory bowel disease. Um, that actually can often give you negative or very low levels of, of caraprotectin. Um, and then people, patients have, have small bowel Crohn's disease or upper GI Crohn's disease. Um, again, fecal caraprotectin, you may get very little of it actually coming through uh, into the stool that, that's available to, to be tested too. We talked before about false positives, um, things that can raise it. So again, gastroenteritis. Uh, it's one of those things that, that can, uh, can increase your levels of, of inflammation. And again, colorectal carcinoma. So again, a patient with raised calprotectin levels may well be IBT. It could also be colorectal cancer as well. And there is evidence that, that patients taking anti-inflammatories can have raised levels um, of calprotectin too. So the next part of the flowchart tells us what to do when we get our calprotectin result back. Lots of laboratories uh, use a level of 50 as being normal result for calprotectin. However, the Academic Health Science Networks and uh, lots of different units around the UK um, now actually use a level of 100. And so there's very little difference between a patient has a level of 50 and a patient with a result of 100. Um, so 100 actually is the new normal um, for calprotectin. And if you have two results uh, of a calprotectin under 50 in a patient aged under 50, then it's 99% likely to be IBS and not IBD. And those patients should go off and treat um, according to the NICE guidance um, with a whole range of different treatments for, for irritable bowel syndrome. But bear in mind, if those patients come back and they're still not responding to any of those treatments, then think about other conditions like microscopic colitis uh, and bile, bile acid malabsorption um, in those patients. And they, they may, may need to be sent off for investigations. They may need biopsies to be done as well. But don't send everybody off without trying IBS treatments, first of all. 
If you get a level that's back that's greater than 250 for carbaprotectin, um, those patients have got a nearly 50% chance likely of, of it being IBD and they need to go off for further investigation. Um, so they need an urgent referral to gastroenterology. And the IBD standards say that those patients should be seen within four weeks of referral. Uh, but we know that actually in reality that doesn't often happen. But if you label it with high calprotectin, suspected IBD, then most seniors may triage that and, and fast track them or at least do investigations before they're seen. So it depends upon your, your local unit for that one. If you get the result back that's between 100 and 250, those are intermediate groups where it's still quite likely it's going to be irritable bowel syndrome rather than IBD. Um, so it's worth actually making sure patients have stopped their, their anti-inflammatories and then repeat that test again. Um, this one says two weeks. The consensus from the, the British Society of Gastroenterology is actually to repeat it within about four weeks. There's no evidence, there's no studies that everyone's aware of that looks at the, the, the effect of that. Um, but two weeks, four weeks is, is, is a consensus for repeating a chiropractic that comes back between 100 and 250. And what we don't want to do is, is to um, clog up secondary care uh, with borderline results um, because they need to see the patients they need to see and we need to manage the patients that we need to manage in primary care. And again, um, what NICE says was, was reiterated in the British side of gastroenterology guidance that was produced last year. So carboprotectin testing. Um, for those of us who've had colonoscopies done, we know they're not fun to have done. Um, they, they're resource intensive, intensive, and there are some risks involved with them. So you know, there's a small risk of bowel perforation um, that goes with it as well. And also secondary care, they don't want to be doing normal colonoscopy or to normal colonoscopy. Um, they want to find the pathology, actually diagnose patients as well. So by introducing calprotectin testing, um, then actually we can reduce referrals to secondary care by 50%, um, reduce colonoscopies by up to 50% as well, and actually make sure the patients that need to be seen are seen in a timely manner and have the right investigation at the right time. So in summary, um, I hope that's given you an overview about what, uh, about the, how to diagnose and investigate patients with, with lower abdominal symptoms. Um, so just think about those extra intestinal manifestations, those patients with atypical symptoms, um, patients with extra intestinal symptoms as well. So skin conditions, eye conditions, we think what that's going on. Um, and also those patients who have been labelled with another condition previously. So whether it's celiac disease or IBS, if they present the symptoms that are outside the normal range, um, then reconsider it and think, is there something else going on? Think about colorectal cancer, think about IBD, um, and maybe go through that investigative pathway again. So again, GPs are brilliant at looking after our patients with IBD. Um, so make sure that we refer the ones that need to be seen, um, but we can give them the, the support that's needed. And we'll come on to that in the, in the, web, the, uh, the next webinars through the series. All this information is available on the toolkit produced by RCGP on rcgp.org.uk slash IBD. There's also an e-learning module that's free for RCGP members on the toolkit as well. Um, so have a look at that and thank you very much for listening.